scattered across this nation, there are places abandoned, boarded up, mysterious. I will unlock their doors and make them yield their secrets. From a military hospital that was the birthplace of plastic surgery. That's a magnificent piece of work. It is a lovely thing. This defies all preconceptions and prejudices. He'd never done that operation before. Firing. To a vast Soviet war machine that brought us to the brink of World War III. Submarine warfare is hide and seek. This is just bristling with torpedoes. One after another could be fired. I've realized today how chillingly close we were to annihilation to a vast Victorian citadel of heroes. The size of it. You've got the authorities, you've got the mob. Where's the fire brigade? In the middle. They've always been in the middle. To the beginning of the Great British Seaside Resort. It's all eerily silent now. How extensive is the sewer system here in Brighton? It's about 44 miles. This will be my hidden history of Britain. In this episode, I step inside the People's Palace, an abandoned cinema from the 1930s. What a magnificent thing. How absolutely spectacular. To discover how it helped us through our darkest hour. I remember vividly thinking, he's mine. Slow, slow. I dread being asked to dance. And find out what it meant to generations who came here to lose themselves in movies and music. We danced it to meet the girls. To Karen, love from the Beatles. What remains inside of all that razzle dazzle? There's only one way to find out. This is the story of how mass media and entertainment transformed this country, of how the silver screen changed us, from how we dressed to how we talked to the way we loved. By the late 1930s, there was a cinema in every town in the country, almost 5,000 nationwide, and we were buying a billion tickets a year. What role did these dream palaces play in the lives of the British people? And how did they shape us? To find out, I'm going to one of the greatest of its day here in West Yorkshire. This was one of the most magnificent public buildings in Bradford, the new Victoria Cinema. And today, it's a wreck. In 2000, the new Vic closed its doors for the last time. It's lain empty and abandoned ever since. Outside, it's a very wet day. And inside, the water is coming through with the same intensity as it's raining outside. Very sad. It may be decrepit today, but this decaying ruin has a fascinating story to tell about how we used to entertain ourselves. When this cinema opened in 1930, it was the largest and most luxurious in England outside London. And it was a trailblazer, the first cinema built for talking pictures at a cost of £250,000, a mind-boggling sum at the time. One advantage of seeing the cinema in this dilapidated state is you get to see how the illusion was created. This is just a brick building with a very thin layer of grandeur, something exotic, something from a distant place. The building is wearing makeup. They called this place the wonder cinema of the North. You feel some of the old grandeur. But reminders like this are few and far between. It's going to take some detective work to understand what it was like in its heyday. It was a place where you would go to escape your life, whether it was work, working down the pit, working in a factory somewhere. Historian Mark Nicholson fell in love with this cinema age five 
and has spent his life researching its history. When the cinemas were first built, they were called dream palaces. He's brought me up to the roof, as it's one of the few places where I can get a glimpse of its past glory. Oh, not straightforward, is it? No. <laughs> Do be careful, there's a beam. OK. OK. These are the roof girders of the New Victoria Theatre when it was first built back in 1929 and 30. And we are now beneath what was the auditorium dome. Fortunately, we still have this central section here. Ha! What a magnificent thing. How absolutely spectacular. Who could believe that this has survived? How superb. It's one of the wonderful things about the original theatre because it was designed that no matter where you were sitting, if you were in the cheap seats at the front stalls or up in the upper balcony, you would still have a magnificent view of marvellous architecture like this. But now you have to climb up into the roof space. But look how the colours and the details have all survived. This discovery really brings home how grand cinemas used to be and how they brought together people from all walks of life. I can only assume that an impressive dome like that had an equally impressive auditorium, but it's going to take some digging to find any trace of it. None of the beautiful original decor is left. It's been rather hideously modernised. In the late 1960s, it was redeveloped as a multi-screen complex. <laughs> Here is a real historic artefact. The seat prices ranging from two shillings, of course, two bob, up to uh, three and nine. Even three and nine, the most expensive, that's less than 20p. I remember prices like that. Mine's a gin and tonic, please. This is one of the screens that dates to that 1960s refurbishment. And I'm guessing we're now at the top of the old cinema. Under this, what was once a magnificent dome, because the theatre was not only broad and long, it was also extremely high. These pictures show that there was originally one vast auditorium seating over 3,000 people. That's 15 times larger than the average modern cinema. And look at this, look. This is where the image was projected, because in those days, when they said the big screen, they meant it. It measured 50 feet wide and 30 feet tall. That screen was brought to life from a projection room. I wonder whether any of it has survived. This wall has these apertures, some, I suppose, for lights, but mainly for the projector. Somewhere back there is where the magic happened. Unmistakably, the projection room. Look at the scale of things. The reel sat on there. And all this industrial-sized machinery to make it work. Some old film here. seems to be all rotten and fused together. Just get an idea of the perforations that powered it through the projector. The technology that enabled you to put one image after another, each just minutely different from the one before, creating the illusion of movement and then of sound, a kind of magic that people came to the cinema in thousands to see more large-scale equipment. When I first came to the cinema as a child, and this will seem ridiculous, it took me a while to realise that the images on the screen really were of an exaggerated size. Big people, big faces, big eyes even. It was the first time I learnt the expression larger than life, which is really, of course, what the cinema is.
Cinema has had a big impact on my life. I started going to see films when I was tiny, really. Um, going to see Roy Rogers at the local cinema and things like that. Dion Hansen used to be one of the top projectionists in the world, working for some of the biggest names in the business. It, it was the thing that you did. You always went to the cinema on a Tuesday night. Tuesday night was cinema night. Today, he and his colleague Alan Foster work to restore magnificent machines like this one. You followed the red carpets around the world, did you? Yes, yes. I did um, the Cannes Film Festival for 15 years, Venice Film Festival 25 years. When we were doing the screenings, I quite often sat with the film director, so Spielberg and people like that. I think my most favourite one was with Barbara Streisand, sitting with her watching Yentl. That was fantastic. How did you find rubbing shoulders with the stars? I, I found it very daunting because you hear so many stories about them, but uh, when they come to see the, the film shown for the first time on a big screen, you find that you're trying to calm them down a little bit because they're very nervous about what their film's going to be like. For a century now, more than a century, we've been obsessed with moving images. What, why do we find it one of the most glamorous things of all, do you think? It has life to it. If you just look at a, a roll of film, it's just a piece of plastic until you project it and then it becomes a moving, living thing. The projected image was the magic at the heart of this building. So next I'm determined to learn some of the magician's tricks. Let it get up to speed. Whoa. This is the abandoned shell of one of Britain's grandest picture palaces, the New Vic in Bradford. Within its walls hides the story of a lost age when we came together in our thousands to surrender to the magic of film. How was that magic brought to life on its 50-foot screen? The first time I went to the cinema was actually in this building. I was five years old and I went to see Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Graham Bird was the cinema's last projectionist. I remember queuing round the block to see Herbie Rides again. I couldn't see the Tower in Inferno with, with my mum. And when you were sitting there, were you stealing glances back at the projection room? Not immediately. Um, that kind of happened when I went to see Star Wars. The projectionist, Tony Coates, he was, he was a bit of a showman, and he put a mirror ball and a big spotlight in the ceiling and prior to the film starting, the auditorium went dark and then these sound effects would kick in. And then after a few moments, he would light the mirror ball and the spotlight and you'd, it'd create this star field in the auditorium. And it created a real buzz. And instead of looking at the screen, I started to look back to see where the image was coming from. I think I was 14 years old. And kind of from that point on, I knew that I wanted to be a, a projectionist. So what do you have to do to thread a film into the projector? Well, if you want to come around here, you can have a go. This stuff is rather special, isn't it? Well, it is, yeah. Handling film is just, it's magic. You know, it's just really exciting to... to... Mm, you're bringing tears to my eyes. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Unit. Unit. Oh. Unit. <laughs> but what I'm going to have to do is put my specs on, because no chance otherwise. OK, what are you doing? If you so... take the end of the film... Ah. Am I going through there? Yep, through. Mm -hmm. That's it. Through there, yeah. It's fiddly, isn't it? It's fiddly. You twist the film, take it over that roller, come down above the small roller. Right, you are. All the way up. That's fine. This is great, this is great. If you pull it across... Come on, then. Finally, after all that time, we've reached the projector. We've got the soundtrack on one side of the film. Can you see that? That's where the soundtrack will be. I can see it, yes. Pull it down a little bit. Yes. Now we form a loop. This is like... Tying a knot on a parcel, you've got to get your finger in there. That's right. Close the aperture gate on the film. Turn the inching knob towards you. Go on, don't be frightened. No, Give it a good all right, turn. don't be frightened. Go on then. That's good. Feeling good. Right. How did you feel when you when you first did this for real? You've been scared. <laughs> well, I can imagine, yes, because a lot of mistakes you can make. Yeah, aren't there? film like... is expensive, so if you damage it, the cinema manager's not going to be very happy. What next? Next, strike the lamp up, quick press, that's it. Press start. This is, uh, this is actually rather exciting. Here we go. Fingers crossed. 
So now the film's running through the projector, and now you pull the dowser open. Towards me? Yeah, just pull it towards you, and hopefully... Whoa! So now we have a projected image. I hate it. Now, was that a dream come true, coming back to your own cinema to be a projectionist? It was fantastic. I was in my element. Best years of my working life so far. Graham wants to show me his favourite part of the cinema. Here on the right is the way through to the original projection box. And this little room here is the tea and biscuit room, where the projectionists used to come and have the breaks. And then through here is where the original projection room was, which was really the heart of the of the building, of the cinema. Just imagine looking down on, uh, on all those people. Three and a half thousand seat auditorium. Now you're talking about the days when this was a single huge theater. Yes. This projection room would have been in use until the cinema closed for conversion in 1968. Do you feel this is kind of the heyday of uh, yes. cinema projection? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I would love to have worked in the cinema back in those days. Two projectors changing over every 20 minutes. It must have been just magic. Every 20 minutes, you're going from one projector to the other. Yes. And the audience doesn't notice that? No, they don't. There's, um, on the end of each reel, there's two Q dots, little round circles, that appeared in the top right-hand corner of the projected image on the screen. So the first one would be the um, signal to the projectionist to start the second machine up, and then they'd switch over, and it would be seamless. As we sit in a cinema with a beam of light passing above our heads, we rarely think back to the projectionist, part mechanic presiding over his whirring apparatus, part magician converting stills into moving images and synchronized sounds, and with someone like Graham, very sensitive to the audience, part impresario. The new Vic was the most advanced cinema in the country. It was the first to be purpose-built for talking pictures. Historian Mark Nicholson is taking me underground to hunt for some of its more surprising technical innovations. Where do you think you are? I haven't a clue. Well, if you can imagine, back in 1930, the air wouldn't have been very clean in the cinemas, lots of people smoking, and it was important for a building of this size to have good, clean air you're actually in the chamber that washed air before it was sent via these extractor fans behind me up into the cinema building. Oh, I've never heard of such thing. How do you wash air? This brick wall behind this grill, this is an outer wall, and a little bit further up at street level, there's a grill, and fresh air from outside was drawn into the building. It would come through here, and this space that we're in at the moment was full of jets that washed the air that had passed through with atomised water. And that was 1930s technology? Yes. This building was put together as um, an example of all the latest cinema innovation. When the new Vic was built, Bradford was a thriving industrial city, its air thick with fumes from its coal-powered textile mills. And it was wealthy. It's been said there were more Rolls Royces here than anywhere else in the country. This building is a relic of those glory days. Ha! Huh. This must once have been a beautiful room. Eight-sided, so we must be inside the tower with windows onto the street. But here, water penetration has brought the ceiling down, revealing the complex beamwork above. Still some remnants of the beautiful frescoes and decoration. Ugh. I'm an inch deep in water here. Although the new Vic is starting to come into focus, there are whole areas of this vast complex where I haven't set foot. Look at this. This is the best condition that I've seen so far. With its glass panels and the ornate surrounds, pretty much intact. And here the floor has been panelled over. I 
underneath a very beautiful floor. The floor is sprung. And I've seen this in my book there. This was once a ballroom. There's now no trace of those beautiful chandeliers, the panelled ceiling. And I found this as well, the new Victoria Ballroom. Tea dances daily, two shillings. Dinner dance, three shillings and sixpence. Really tells us pretty eloquently what a very fine ballroom it was. And the only mystery is, why did a cinema have a ballroom? What I do know is there's a great tradition of music in the movies and that the 1930s was the golden age of the Hollywood musical. These spectacular routines feature swing dancers Ray Hirsch and Patti Lacey, and they're showcasing a variety of extraordinary swing steps that were immensely popular at the time. These movies inspired generations of ordinary men and women to take to the dance floor. A group of local vintage dancers and former New Vic regulars are going to bring the New Vic's ballroom back to life for one night only. What is your earliest memory of this ballroom? Well, we came dancing here when we were young, young lads. When we were 14, 15 years of age, now 90 now. Were you struck by its glamour? Yes, it's a long time ago. And we danced to, to meet the girls and to, to, we were learning then in those days all the popular dancers. And we liked the tango, that was very special. What does it mean to you, the building? I'm like, my husband, yeah, that time dancing here. It was wonderful. Did you go to the we cinema used to too? Go to the cinema. We went once or twice a week. Did you? We went nearly every Sunday. This is the ballroom of what used to be a cinema. Yes. Now, do you think there's a connection between people's wish to dance and seeing brilliant dancing on the screen? Yes. Yeah. Who was inspired by a movie? Yes. All the friends there. Uh, All the friends there. Ginger time. Rogers. Oh. Anyone else inspired by a movie? Greece. 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 <laughs> Singing in the rain. Singing in the rain. All that business. Yeah. <laughs> oh, now you're talking. Group leader Marie McCaffrey teaches 1930s and 40s dancing. She's going to help me follow in the footsteps of decades of dancers. Even though I have two left feet. Slow. Which, slow, which, which slow. way am I going? Slow. No, the other foot. You have to mirror me. Oh, I, absolutely. Nice. I dread being asked to dance because I have no sense at all of rhythm. No, don't move no, that sorry. foot. Slow. I'm afraid she has her work cut out for her. No, no, no slow at the end. It's just slow, slow, quick, quick. No, I'm not getting it at all. Sorry. Across our nation, picture palaces like Bradford's New Vic stand as reminders of a lost age, when we came together to be entertained. I want to find out what this place meant to generations lured here by the silver screen, and to those drawn to its ballroom to lose themselves in music. Slow, slow. slow. Quick, quick. No, put that foot behind. Keep that foot where it is. Right. Slow, slow. slow. Quick, 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 quick. No, don't lose no, that sorry. foot. Yes. With slow. vintage dance no, no, enthusiast no, no, Marie yeah. McCaffrey, slow, slow, I'm stepping into slow. their shoes. How are we relating to each other anymore? So, we so we're like this, so slow, slow, quick, quick, slow, 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 quick. So next time we go around, swap hands. Maybe you can teach an old dog new tricks. Right, do this one, just in and out. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
Oh, so good. Oh. Now, tell me, given that this is so exhausting, why on earth do you do this dance? It keeps you fit, it keeps you mentally fit, because it's freestyle, as you saw. You. A fantastic social life, wonderful people you meet every week. What were you dancing then, and what was I imitating? Uh, that was Swing Jive, and it's what was going on in yes. the 30s and 40s. Lindy Hop, uh, Bill Balboa, Collegiate Shag, that kind of thing. Oh, sound like quite a lot of swear words and all of that, but perhaps they weren't. <laughs> yeah, we do like having our little puns on that as well. <laughs> um, did anybody meet their partner dancing? Yes. Yes. Who did? Yes. Any man here was a complete klutz before they started dancing? Most of them. I bet, I bet you're not. Show me a couple of moves, go on. Let's see this. Oh. Yeah. Yes, magic. Absolutely magic. A new couple together. You're a new couple as well? Yeah, we are. Yes. There's really something in this dancing business. Your coat could be inspired by Humphrey Bogart. Is he yeah, well, I mean, this, this is actually an original 1940s uh, coat. Of all the gin joints this side of town, why do you have to pick this one? I mean, yeah, something like that. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> why do those movies uh, have well, such an effect on us? Well, I don't know. I think they're just. There's just something about them, isn't there? It's, it's the style, the people. I mean, when you think about it, I mean, people had nothing in those days. And I think they had to celebrate what they had. And I think it was the music, the dancing. Because, I mean, it wasn't a great time for anybody, really, was it, with what was going on? So I think, you know, those moments when they were in a bar or dancing, you know, it was just like a bit of an escapism because everything around them was in turmoil, as you know. In 1939, Britain was engulfed by war. And in August 1940, Hitler's Luftwaffe rained bombs down on Bradford. When the building shook, the band paused. Then, in full blitz spirit, the jitterbugging continued while the raid devastated the city. Music and movies were the perfect escape from the reality of war. More than 25 million cinema tickets were sold every week. In a world strained by international conflict, citizens... But cinema was also how people received news of what was happening at the front. And as the war dragged on, film would serve a radical new purpose. The War Office would film personal messages from frontline troops in Asia. How about the rocks you put in now? <laughs> Hello, Madge. How are you? How are you? Their families back home watched them in the local cinema. They all look so brave and so positive, don't they? Yeah. Well, they were. For the first time, talking pictures were used to connect ordinary people on opposite sides of the world. In February 1944, Anne Boardman came here to watch her father speak to her from India. Little Anne Boardman, aged five and a half, sat in the new Victoria cinema at Bradford yesterday and heard a sun-tanned man on the screen say, <laughs> Hello, Anne and Michael. Ooh, that's my daddy, she said. I remember vividly thinking, he's mine, I'm clear. Because <laughs> my brother was a, a, a mummy's boy. And uh, so I thought, right, I've one for myself. <laughs> Which is natural between girls and their fathers, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I wanted my dad home. I don't, I didn't want to see him on the pictures, really. I wanted him. At home. Must have increased the sense of separation even more, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll say it if you won't. He's a very good looking young man. Tell me what we see in these photographs. Um, that's my brother, my younger brother, and my mum. I, I, I can remember um, sat there watching uh, the screen. Do you remember anything about uh, what impact it had on, uh, on your mother being able to see? your father on the screen? I can't remember. Um, she would put on a good show for us. She would, you know, uh, for me and my brother. 
thinking about it now, the impact of her husband appearing on the screen in the cinema it must be pretty powerful, don't you think? Oh, without a doubt. In our world today of instant video messaging, it's hard to imagine how magical it must have seemed during World War II to hear and see a loved one, long since departed for distant battlefields, speaking from the big screen. But that moment of extraordinary intimacy had to be shared with an audience of thousands. Appearances had to be maintained. Sobs had to be choked back. Keep calm and carry on. And keep smiling, chill. The 1940s was the peak of our passion for going to the pictures. The rise of television in the 1950s signaled the end of cinema's golden age. And the way we related to each other was transformed almost overnight. Here on the cinema's main stage, the building's tragic decay is more evident than anywhere else. The rain is coming in like a waterfall and the sodden centre of the stage is actually condemned. It's unsafe to step on there and it is a mess of pigeon droppings and pigeon feathers. But just look at this glorious height and at that wonderful brickwork. And why did they build so high? Because the proscenium arch was so enormous. And in this old photograph, you see how it dwarfed the moviegoers in their seats. Here is a postcard looking across the auditorium towards this immense proscenium, and you see the auditorium built in a fan shape. With cinema in decline, how would this building, now rebranded the Gaumont, embrace the tide of change brought by the social revolution of the 1960s? Do you deliberately try and create these sort of screaming reactions? No, we just, you know, arrive at the theater and they're always there waiting. <laughs> Although it's dark and stark now, I can see all the screaming girls there in the auditorium. I can mix through in my mind through that crowded night with it hot and sweaty and dim lights and everybody screaming away. In 1963, Paul Berrick was a teenager with a passion for photography. It's about capturing that moment in the split second, freezing the image forever, really. As a hobby, he photographed all the hottest new rock and roll bands. So was the new Victoria the Gaumont really a, a great venue for visiting rock groups and singers? Oh yes, I mean, very much like the rest of the northern locations. There was ABC in Manchester, ABC in Huddersfield, the Odeon in Leeds. They're all big theatres like this, which were ideal for uh, putting on these shows. These are photographs I took here 54 years ago. I was 16 years of age, junior photographer. I used the Beatles as uh, training for my photography skills. You used the Beatles? <laughs> well, they were relatively newcomers then anyway. Where were you standing when you got this image? Uh, I was uh, on the right here, uh, looking across the stage. And the great thing about the cinema here, as it was, they got these lovely drapes, which uh, was fabulous for photography. So here... I'm yeah. looking at the Beatles That's... on this stage, yeah. at the very beginning of their career. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? What was the atmosphere like? Unbelievable. Just high-pitched screaming from all the girls that were there. I was on the side of the stage there. I couldn't hear them singing at all. And uh, afterwards, I talked to Paul about it, and he said, we can't hear what we're singing anyway. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that is, uh, that's real history. Yeah, yeah. But it looks like you, uh, you, you had an opportunity to get kind of intimate with them. Yes, I came to, to Gormont twice. Paul would ask me how my photography was going. What's so lovely about this is they're all so relaxed, so natural, it's good of each of them. Mm. Was it difficult to get them to, to be that relaxed? No, they just fell into it and, we, you know, I, I don't like posy pictures as such and the piano was there and we just said, give us a sing-song and they just sat down and started singing. This one of Paul was taken in the dressing room backstage here. Wow. It's a great image. Do you regard this as one of the special moments of your career? Not long after this, I became an official press photographer and all these disappeared into my attic. Really? And 45 years later, I found this box with 600 negatives in it 
about 100 were the Beatles and Rolling Stones, Hendrix, Pink Floyd, you name it. To think of this place as a cinema is to underplay it. And the day that the Beatles performed here is an important moment in its biography. Paul Berry's black and white photos document its history as much as any of the films that were shown here. Having had the satisfaction of seeing his still images published, Paul was drawn to a career in the world of moving pictures, as though inspired by the genie of this building. The following year, the Beatles would return to the Gaumont as the biggest band on the planet. I'll uncover a personal moment amidst the media storm that would stay with one child of the 60s forever. To Karen, love from the Beatles. In the middle of the 20th century, we flocked in our millions to picture palaces like the Gaumont in Bradford. I'm discovering how, as cinema lost its grip on the public's imagination, this building reinvented itself as one of the hottest live music venues in the country. It's the first time I've been here in over 50 years. I have butterflies. Karen Grimaldi was just five years old when her father brought her here to meet the most famous band in the world. It's one of the uh, most memorable experiences I have of being with my father. And how was it that you were being invited to the Beatles dressing room? My father was a journalist uh, for the Daily Worker at the time yes. and had some sort of uh, contact. And when we found out they were playing locally, my father had asked if he could bring me along to meet them, which they were very happy for him to do. So it was John's birthday the day before, and I had uh, spent months practicing singing happy birthday ready for this eventuality. Ha! <laughs> and you came to a dressing room, maybe a bit like this one. Do you recall the glamour of a room like this? Wow. <laughs> My strongest memory of the room is actually the number of people that they'd managed to fit in. Um, it seemed to be full of reporters and photographers. We were sitting the Beatles and then Mary Wells just to the side. And my father said to John that I'd been practising singing. So he actually stood me on the table. But, that that uh, was to put you on the spot. My main memory of that moment was the heat and the sound from all of the bulbs going, I can, can, can. So I climbed back down off the table. But instead of going over to my dad, I actually climbed down onto John's knee. When you tried to sing, the words didn't come out, did you? I, no, I just didn't even start, I'm afraid. It was such an overwhelming experience with all the... Uh, Press there. Oh, oh, and after the, all that practice. After all that practice. <laughs> oh, what a shame. As I hadn't managed to sing, the Beatles sang Happy Birthday on my behalf for John. <laughs> <laughs> and do you have any mementos of it? I do, I do actually. Let me um, hold that for you. Thank you very much. A few days later, we received a beautiful photograph which I've obviously cherished ever since, and um, another photograph with autographs on the back. To Karen, love from the Beatles. What does this moment mean to you now when you look back on it? Unfortunately, uh, four years after this, my father tragically died, and this became a wonderful link to my father and something that we did together, which was hugely momentous. And uh, yeah, I, it's very precious to me. History comes in layers, as this building demonstrates. Here was a momentous public performance by the Beatles, a national event. But within it, a little five-year-old girl tried to sing Happy Birthday to John Lennon. And that now supplies her with her most precious memory of the brief time that she and her father got to spend together. For 70 years, Bradford audiences lost themselves here in the magic of film and music. But by the year 2000, the building, by then an Odeon cinema, no longer drew the crowds that it once did, and its famous doors closed for the final time. All grandeur is transitory, and here vegetation has attacked the building. 
making it feel more like a ruin from the Roman Empire or the Peruvian jungle than an old cinema. It may have been the end of an era, but this building would unite the people of Bradford one more time. What's going on on the screen behind us now? This is footage of the Hug the Odeon event. This happened in July 2007. Mark Nicholson and Lee Craven campaigned to save this piece of British history from demolition. We used to receive a lot of letters and emails from local people that were following the campaign, and one of them wrote, if anyone cares about this building, they should just come down to the centre of Bradford one day and hug it. If we just call for some uh, marshals, just to make sure that everybody is uh, holding hands all the way around the building, please. About a thousand people actually turned up on the day. We encircled the entire perimeter of the building, including the land at the rear. It was just amazing, you know, triumph. How did you feel when you heard that it was under threat of demolition? Quite sad, because I loved the place when it was a cinema. The regeneration company that owned the building was saying there was nothing worth saving about it. All of the original architecture had gone. It was just a decrepit death trap that had a 30-year lifespan. Forget it, move on, we'll give you a, an office block instead. And we, no, this isn't what we want for Bradford. Lee, what's your connection with the building? My mum and dad actually met here in the ballroom. Oh. So I owe my existence to this building. So. Because they came to dance? Yes. How lovely. So, t to save a building, you need a plan for the future? Yes. And what plan have you put together? We're going to strip out the old cinemas and uh, restore the original size and shape of the main auditorium from the 1930s, from the new Vic Gaumont days, and restore the ballroom and the restaurant. Um, and then run it as a big live music, live entertainment venue run by a big commercial operator, which is the NEC Group from Birmingham. With its future secure, it looks like the new Vic will continue to bring people together, as it's done across almost a century. No history of Bradford could ignore this building. It was the people's palace. No matter where you were sitting, you would still have a magnificent view of marvellous architecture like this. Audiences came here in their thousands during the golden era of the movies. This stuff is rather special, isn't it? Handling film is just, it's magic. In the darkest days of war, it helped families to reach out to each other across the globe. I wanted my dad home. I don't, I didn't want to see him on the pictures, really. Look at this. In its ballroom, Nervous couples first joined perspiring hands in partnerships that would last a lifetime. Yeah, magic. You're a new couple as well? Yeah, we are. Yes. There's really something in this dancing business. At a time when nearby Liverpool was the world's leading musical city, singing legends graced its stage. What was the atmosphere like? Unbelievable, just high-pitched screaming from all the girls that were there. It's now a pitiable ruin, but the aim is, as the Beatles might have put it, to get it back to where it once belonged. In the next programme, I go in search of the lost age of the British seaside. You weren't in the sea, but you were on the sea. A town built for fun. Men and women bathing together, very saucy, very continental. The numbers of seating for spectators was always much bigger than for the swimmers themselves because of the flesh that was now on show. The stabbing of Boris, a fantasy. Oh, oh, oh. With a dark underbelly. Some kind of vision of hell, I don't even want to touch it. And in the centre of it all, a moment that would devastate a family. I remember looking into his eyes and, and seeing something of him that meant he wasn't just the man who killed my dad.